Good evening, everyone. Since we're streaming live, I, we've, I want us to get started. Um, I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the aquarium. It's great to see all of you who are here in person. We want to welcome all of those who are watching remotely. For those of you here, I would appreciate it if you would turn your cell phones off or put them on vibrate and try to refrain from tweeting or texting for the next hour. So to, I want to also acknowledge the sponsors for our lecture series, Gazette Newspapers, and the Marriott Courtyard. Tonight, it's a pleasure to welcome back an old friend, Dominique Rizzolo. He's going to talk about new tools and documentation methods for cultural heritage research at underwater sites. Dominique is an archaeologist and an anthropologist. He's an assistant researcher at the University of California, San Diego's Qualcomm Institute and he's also on the, the faculty of U UC San Diego. He's explored the Yucatans, coastal sites, and caves in search of Maya antiquities related to seafaring, commerce, and ritual practice. He's been, a, as I mentioned, a research a scientist at the Center for Interdisciplinary Science for Art, Architecture, and Archaeology at UCSD. He has directed uh, National Geographic Society and Weight Foundation grants, and uh, he uh, serves on the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Ocean Exploration Advisory Board. So he's an ocean explorer, and uh, he was also the person who had the lead role in organizing the most recent Ocean Exploration Forum that took place at Qualcomm last, last fall. And he's been involved, I guess, in almost all of these forums, and there's ones coming up this fall at the uh, Media Lab at MIT. And we have a partnership with Qualcomm, and Dominique is the designated lead for Qualcomm in the partnership between the Aquarium and Qualcomm Institute. He uh, was born in Connecticut, Grew up mostly in Georgia, came to California, went to high school. He got a, a BA in geology and anthropology from San Diego State and an MA and a PhD in anthropology from UC Riverside. Please join me in welcoming Dominic Rizzolo. Aquarium and, and Jerry had mentioned the first National Ocean Exploration Forum, Ocean 2020, and that was, uh, it's all started here. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember my kids right out, outside playing with the ROV, open ROV in the pool, and, um, and it all sort of, you know, all started with uh, at Long Beach, so it was pretty exciting. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, we're going to talk about something maybe uh, sort of on the fringes of what we would consider to be ocean exploration, although we are going to be in marine water. Um, and we'll talk about how understanding the paleo coastline of the Americas is integral to our understanding of the peopling of the Americas. And so um, I guess it's sufficiently dark enough in here. I know we could probably lower the lights if you want to make it a little bit more cave-like. Otherwise, I think it's OK. Um, so uh, this is sort of also a prov provocative image, Susan Bird um, handling uh, what is the, one of the oldest sets of human remains yet found in the New World. And we'll be talking about this site, Oyo Negro, because what I, I want to really discuss with you this evening is this enduring mystery uh, among uh, American archaeologists having to do with the peopling of the New World. The first Americans, you know, who were they? Where did they come from? When did they arrive in this new land? What routes did they take? And what can these sites, many of them at the bottom of these deep caves in the Yucatan Peninsula, what can they tell us about about this mystery of the first Americans. And uh, so we're going to kind of move through the story of the discovery of Oyo Negro and its implications for our understanding of uh, America's uh, Ice Age past. So let's see if we're, how, we, how we're doing here. OK, so I, I want to mention, of course, that I'm um, one of a, a, a large group of researchers and explorers. Um, this is certainly um, not the, not the, <laughs> the the product of any one person's um, work uh, in Mexico. So I want to acknowledge our survey and exploration team, it's extraordinarily talented uh, underwater cave explorers and scientists from a, a, across the broadest range of disciplines from archaeology, anthropology, paleontology, micropaleontology, biology, hydrogeochemistry, um, geomorphology. Um, it really brings, uh, uh, 
we br bring a great team to, to a site like Oya Negro. And really, through this interdisciplinary research, we're, we're better able to understand the, the importance of a, of a place like Oya Negro. So I just wanted to recognize our team here, our primary, our, our lead um, director of the project, Pilar Luna, um, who's shown here and uh, on the screen is, um, I don't know if her name might be known to some of you, but she's the sort of the mother of underwater archaeology in Latin America, and, and we're really privileged and honored to be working with her on this project. So when we think of the Yucatan Peninsula, we think of, when we think of the ancient Yucatan Peninsula, we think of the Maya. Okay? But what we'll be talking about today is a time thousands of years, 10 millennia before the Maya were even a people. Um, so when you, I mean, many of you have probably been to what's called the Riviera Maya, the Caribbean coast of the Yucatan Peninsula and the state of Quintana Roo, you may be familiar with sites like Uxmal um, to the west, um, Chichen Itza in the center part of the peninsula, and sites like Tulum along the Caribbean coast. These are Maya centers, and of course the ones on the east coast um, quite late in uh, sort of the latter part of Maya civilization, the post-classic period and the eve of Spanish conquest. And, so our you know, kind of notion, and for me as, a, as an archaeologist, when I thought of the Yucatan Peninsula, I always thought of the Maya. I didn't really think about maybe what was going on there at the end of the last glacial maximum. And, um, and it's through work in, in this area that uh, we came to realize the potential for these Pleistocene studies um, on the Yucatan Peninsula. So um, if some of you have been there. This is a, a, a part of Mexico that's largely devoid of mountains um, and rivers. Um, though there are some uh, hydrologically closed basins like lakes on the peninsula, but most of the water is underground in what are called cenotes. It's from the Maya tzonot, um, which means water-filled cave, and uh, the, the common term now is cenote. And uh, these cenotes are all across the Yucatan Peninsula, but we have these unique type of, um, of formation on the eastern coast of the peninsula where you have these underground river systems with these rivers flowing underground from west to east, discharging onto the reefs of the Caribbean and Mexico. Um, and it's in these cenotes and caves that I, I started my work now, I think over 25 years ago, um, uh, focusing not, not on, on all things underwater and not necessarily on all things prehistoric, but I wanted to understand how the ancient Maya interacted with caves, how they transformed caves, how they were imagined by the ancient Maya. And so I spent a, a good part of my dissertation research inside caves trying to reconstruct ancient Maya ritual practice from the material remains that I was finding inside these caves. Um, and that's a whole other topic of, of, of conversation, but uh, that's what kind of drew me to the caves and, and cenotes of Quintana Roo. And I, I quickly realized, though, that um, my research was sort of, sort of stopped at the water's edge. So the Maya were clearly using not only the dry portions of the caves, but the wet portions as well. Many of these uh, caves end in a pool of water that, uh, that enters into these complex underground river systems. And they were making deposits at water's edge. And so in order to really understand ancient Maya ritual cave use and cenote use, I needed to start diving. And so I, I started with a, um, you know, kind of making this transition from the way I used to go caving into the way I prefer to go caving now. Um, much cooler, uh, easier to breathe, surprisingly, underwater than it is in the, in the open cave air. Um, and so I'm still very much a guppy, um, you know, working with people who are far more experienced than me, but um, I'm starting to sort of move into these environments, uh, you know, to, to understand, um, for me, um, a little bit more about ancient Maya cave use. And I um, was lucky to study under uh, Bill Phillips, who passed away last year. He's one of the one of the greats in underwater cave exploration, really a, amazing person, and um, he was one of my one of the people who introduced me to cenote diving. So, why are these cenotes important? Um, well, for the archaeologists, they provide a very unique view into Mexico's earliest human past. Um, at the end of the last glacial maximum, the end of the ice age, as many of you know, sea levels were up to 100 meters lower than they are today, and so caves like this one people and animals would have been able to walk through them. Right? So when you look at the stalactites and stalagmites, you know that they don't form underwater. They form in a dry cave environment. So they formed when sea levels were lower. Right? And at that time, these dripstone formations are, are, are kind of filling up the cave, and um, you know, animals are walking into these caves and walking out of them, some of them seeking shelter, some of them seeking water, um, some of them seeking prey. Um, and humans are making their way into these caves as well. well at the end of the Ice Age, sea levels rise globally, 
and these caves fill up with water. And they lie pretty much untouched and undisturbed until intrepid underwater cave explorers in the 1980s started to get in deep inside of them, and they were finding things. And so this is the story of one of those discoveries uh, where the underwater cave explorers have really opened a whole new field of research for archaeologists and paleontologists on the Yucatan Peninsula. This is a photo taken from a buddy of mine, Sam Meacham. Um, so one of the first important discoveries was uh, made by Tom Young, Jim Koch, 1988. And it was of a, the remains of, a, of, of an older woman um, in a cave known as Najaron. And now, she has not been securely dated, but based on the presence of this skeleton deep inside a cave, it was immediately apparent that this individual had to predate the flooding of the cave. There was no other way to account for the presence of a relatively well-articulated skeleton deep inside a horizontal cave passage, right? These people weren't swimming into these caves. You know right away that she came to rest or was laid to rest on a dry cave floor, and then by definition had to predate the flooding of the cave at the end of the last ice age. So we already know that something's going on here, that we have the opportunity to have access to these sets of human remains that um, that date to this very early period. Uh, <clears throat> the discovery that really sort of got this rolling was at Oyo Negro, and, and that's what we're going to focus on today, in a, a, cave, a cave system called Octunhu. Um, and the deposit is at uh, 1,200 meters horizontal from the nearest entrance that we believe humans and animals were using for ingress into the system at 43 meters depth, about 100 and between 130 and 160 feet, the majority of the deposits. And this was discovered by three underwater cave explorers, uh, Beto Nava, um, Alex Alvarez, and Franco Todini in 2007. And they, um, after they made this discovery, after they saw something like this, I mean, you go into a cave, you know, you're you know, not too far from Cancun, you know, in the Yucatan Peninsula, and you say, hmm, like, what's going on here? Elephant bones, <laughs> you know, on the Caribbean coast of Mexico. Something pretty spectacular is going on, and, and they knew that they had found a remarkable site and shared these photographs with me in 2008. Um, and I uh, won't go into sort of the evolution of the project, but um, needless to say, many of the, the archaeologists and paleontologists who saw those photos the cave divers were bringing back were super excited um, that we have now the potential to, to have a look at a number of these specimens for which we don't have complete um, skeletons in other parts of the Americas. So something very unique about Oyo Negro. Um, so let me kind of show you how all of this works. These are all flooded cave passages, right? And we have a number of entrances, Virgen, Oasis, Ichpalam, means Eye of the Jaguar, and Maya, La Concha. And uh, the divers put in at these entrances and swim, right, usually using scooters, um, to get to this juncture between these different underground river systems. And this is the site of Oya Negro. It's a pit. It's a deep pit with inside the cave. And we'll kind of look at this from a number of different perspectives so you can get a sense of the morphology and why that's important and how it lends itself to um, to the kind of flight formation processes that we see um, here in, um, in this part of Mexico. So here's kind of a cross section, um, and this is the pit itself, right? So this is a, a karst window that opened up. Um, we can now use this as an entrance into the system so the divers can come in here. They don't have to swim nearly as far to get to, the, to Oye Negro. But what you're looking at here is a pit, and it would have been a pit in prehistory as well. So now imagine when we look at, when we look at all the other photographs, images to follow, you think about what's going on here, right? So you have people and animals who are making their way through these passages when they're dry. It's dark, right? It's completely dark. There's no ambient light. Um, uh, many of these animals, and certainly humans, had to go in with torches in order to see where they're going. Some animals obviously don't have the benefit of going in with torches and would sort of stumble around, probably smelling water, um, and ultimately arriving at this precipice, which came upon them very quickly. Many of them went over and down, down they went to their death. So a death trap deep inside this cave. And so this is, this is the site, and this is the site we'll be talking about today. Oops, let me go back real quick. Um, and so, uh, and I also want you to think about this from sort of a diachronic perspective. Things are changing over time. Sea levels are going up as the glaciers melt. This water's filling up with caves, or filling up with water um, as the, as the as sort of eustatic sea level rise occurs. It's pushing up the freshwater lens and it's that fresh water that's starting to flood the cave with the salt water below it, et cetera. Um, and what's happening is all of these different site formation processes, all the different um, ways that sediment and, and, um, and organisms can get into the cave, all of that changes over time because it's a very dynamic, uh, sort of rapid 
rise in sea level over a few short thousand years that resulted in the full flooding of the cave. And, and we could talk about this a little bit later because this is the sort of thing that I'm really excited about because my sort of expertise in, in cave research was site formation in cave context. So we're looking at all of these natural processes and, and um, how they result in the kinds of deposits we find today in caves. So I kind of want to walk you through a little bit of kind of what's involved in this kind of exploration and kind of field work with the divers. Now, I stay relatively close to the entrance. I'm a cavern diver. I'm not full cave. So um, uh, the, the divers that we work with uh, far exceed my expertise underwater. And there's no, really no point in me getting to their level of, of expertise since um, you know, they're the, the eyes and the hands of the archaeologists. They're the astronauts. We're back at mission control. Um, we come up with the priority research tasks. They execute them. It's a very good way to structure a research project. Um, no one gets killed. Um, the work gets done. So these are really uh, amazing people that we've been fortunate enough to work with and are an integral part of our research team in Quintana Roo. Obviously, a lot of breathing gas involved. But we'll look at some other pictures later. We made that transition from open circuit to closed circuit rebreathers um, uh, uh, for a number of reasons having to do with uh, not only uh, increased bottom time, but also um, to uh, less disturbance of the site. Okay, and we'll, we'll kind of explain how that works in a second. So uh, here is um, you know, Susan and Roberto and Alex. They're g going for a dive, entering the system, scootering through um, over 2,000 uh, feet of passageway to get to that pit. And as you know, I look at these video and photographs of them making their way to the pit deep inside the cave, I always think about these animals walking into these caves. Right? You think of the elephants walking into the caves, extinct proboscideans, not exactly elephants, but gonthopteres. We'll look at that in a bit. But, um, other kinds of critters making their way into these. And so, and I, I should mention, as we kind of move through um, Oya Negro, and this is something we hadn't published on yet, but you know, I'm always thinking, well, why aren't we looking down? Because shouldn't we be seeing footprints? Well, for the first time um, this last field season, uh, uh, our divers noticed bear footprints, Pleistocene bear footprints for the first time, and we have to go back and document those, which is really exciting. It's the first example of that anywhere, and we can see that there are different um, sizes, potentially ages. You can maybe kind of get some sense of the behavior of these animals as they're walking around inside the cave, and now, of course, it's completely flooded, and it's the divers who are discovering these things. Beautiful preservation. And so they make their way to the edge of this precipice, and it is a, just an immediate drop. And when they first discovered Oya Negro, it's like they just sort of flew off the edge of the cave and into this black hole, which, of course, what Oya Negro means. And we're just, you know, the, it just sucked the light right from their, from their, from their flashlights. And you know, <laughs> they couldn't even begin to imagine what was at the bottom of this cave. And so they knew they were in some place special. And, and, uh, and, and indeed, they were. So we had an opportunity to do with some um, creative photography, painting with light, to give you a sense of what this pit looks like when it's illuminated. Um, and so you can see the precipice here. These are different passages that lead into the pit. The bottom is uh, filled with collapse. There's also speleothem growth since it was, um, this was all open um, with no water at the bottom for obviously a, a, a good long part of prehistory. And it's down here at the bottom of this pit where we find these human and animal remains. So the first thing that Alex Alvarez came upon were these massive bones of femur and, uh, and a sacrum for a uh, um, pelvis of a, an animal known as a gomphotheer. Okay, so it's related to uh, the Colombian mammoth and mastodon. It's a little bit smaller. It's an extinct species of proboscidean that lived um, throughout Mexico. But to find them and find a number of them inside this cave was a pretty surprising thing. Um, and so we have uh, gomphotheer. Um, you can show here this is the four-tusked version. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the femur here. It's still nicely articulated with the pelvis. Um, here's a tusk. Beautifully preserved. And if you look at this beautiful rendering of Pleistocene fauna um, uh, in Mexico, of this sort of group of, of Ice Age megafauna and, um, and some of the, the smaller mammals, we have these represented in Oya Negro. So we consider to be a fairly diverse assemblage of fauna, now 13 species of large animals, not including bats and fish and other critters inside Oya Negro, but just remarkable. Really sort of a La Brea tar pits, but without the tar. So instead of swimming through tar, you're swimming through gin clear water, which makes for a very different kind of, of, of site documentation um, than, than what we have to go through at La Brea, <laughs> because we can't really see until you, until you get into the tar. Um, 
A number of, of interesting specimens. Uh, um, short-faced bear, this is the South American short-faced short bear. You can see the cranium here, beautifully preserved. Everything's laid out on the cave floor. Um, this is the only uh, recorded specimen of a South American short-faced bear found outside of South America. So maybe it's not the South American short-faced bear anymore. Um, we have examples of it um, in Oyo Negro. Here you can see its pelvis, um, another cranium, this one embedded in, um, in Bakwano. Um, Smilodon, saber-toothed cat, certainly roaming around here in ancient Long Beach. Uh, this is the first um, cranium found in Mexico of a saber-toothed cat, or Smilodon. We see it here with a peccary. We have cougar as well. And I should mention, these are all in marine water, which is interesting, right? So we're below the halocline where the fresh water meets the salt water. So you have to kind of punch down through that fresh water um, which is less dense, into the salt water, and the site is all entirely in salt water. So it's all in marine water. Um, and, uh, and we can talk a little bit about what that means for preservation in a bit. And remember, these are waters that, at the higher levels, that fresh water flows to the sea. And uh, since we have both Smilodon and, and giant ground sloth down there, I always like to think I like this image because they're kind of duking it out. I don't know if that's what really happened. But um, certainly more than one sloth had met their demise in Oya Negro. And what we were most excited about is that one of these giant ground sloths was entirely new to science, a new genus and a new species. That a, was a remarkable thing. Um, and we named it Nohoch Chichak, um, Shibabaka, which means giant clawed cave dweller. <laughs> And, uh, and that's our new sp species and genus of, of giant ground sloth, which is just remarkable. You can see its massive pelvis here. This is a meter stick for scale. I mean, these, it's just incredible, the animals inside this cave. So this gives you like in a sense of what's going on here in terms of, of the different animals represented. Um, and we're starting to put all of those down on the map. But what we'll look at it here in a bit is the real challenge of trying to, um, trying to document a site like Oyo Negro, that's deep and completely dark. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the most remarkable discovery, at least for the archaeologists, at the site of Oyo Negro, and that was of a young woman that we named Naya. And uh, you can see here her cranium. She's resting on her, one of her hum humeri. And this was really a spectacular discovery. The reason it's so significant is we only have five sets of human remains, partial sets of human remains that have been dated to 12,000 years or earlier, anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, only five. Only two of those have intact crania, and none of them have an intact or full uh, dental arcade. So it's extremely unusual to find human remains that date to this earliest period of the peopling of the Americas. And so any discovery of human remains from this early period is, um, is a special thing because we have so few and there's so much we can learn from the skeletons of these individuals, especially the crania, especially the cranium mandible, the skulls. So we um, attempted to do some very uh, um, rapid documentation to get good uh, morphology of the cranium itself. Um, a couple of experimental techniques were used. Um, including uh, a, a type of approach to laser scanning, um, more like structured light scanning, that, was, um, that w produced reasonable results, but we knew that we were going to have um, to spend a little bit more time devising other techniques uh, in order to get, um, to get good documentation because we didn't want to take her out of the cave just yet. We weren't ready to do that for a variety of reasons. Um, also having to do with not having a fully vetted conservation plan in place. So the decision was made is to record as much as we could of her skeleton in situ or in, within her immediate environment and then, um, and then work with those data as best we can. So fortunately, because of advances in, in structure from motion photogrammetry, we were able to produce a very uh, accurate and precise model of her cranium and her mandible. And this is a textured mess produced by Corey, uh, Corey Jaskowski. And um, it was from these data, these 3D data, without, this is all, all this data was acquired in the cave, right? We didn't take her out. She wasn't scanned in a lab. She was scanned in the cave. Um, allowed us then to, uh, to do the morphometric analysis of her cranium and to even do a facial reconstruction, a forensic facial reconstruction using the Gerasimov method. This was done by Jim Chatters. Um, to get a sense of 
what she may have looked like. And this was actually published on the cover of National Geographic in January of 2015, um, uh, the story of Naya, um, the, the oldest complete set of human remains yet found in the Americas. So we're very excited about that. And this is an iterative process. So this is kind of ongoing research to kind of um, continue to work with data as they, as they come to light about, um, about her, about what she may have looked like um, when she was alive. And we're learning more and more about her skeleton now that we have um, her, her bones recovered and in the lab. So why is this so important? Um, why are the, these crania so important? Well, so much of who we are and the populations that we represent can be sort of culled from our cranial facial morphology, right? So it's our faces and our, our, our skulls sort of tell a story about, about us and about where we came from and what other populations um, that we, we may call ancestors. And this also is part of a mystery, um, something of a mystery, and perhaps even a bit of a debate or controversy among uh, people who study the peopling of the Americas, in that one thing that we became, be became obvious is that the crania of the earliest Americans, the skulls of the earliest Americans, do not look like the crania or the skulls of Native Americans. So many of us, um, many people, uh, many archaeologists believe that, um, that the New World was peopled by individuals coming from Northeast Asia across the Bering Strait, across Beringian into the Americas. So why do we have this sort of dissimilar cranial facial morphology? Why do the, the earliest Americans look so different from modern Native Americans or the recent ancestors of, of Native Americans? So there are some very pronounced differences. So for our early Americans like Naya, and there are many others, um, not all of them dated, but we know we have other earlier crania, is that the faces tend to be a little bit shorter, um, the crania narrower, sort of lack of flaring zygomatics, um, a slight prognathism or forward projection of the face. Um, and so there are many different sort of features of the, of the skulls that are different, that they don't group morphometrically um, with the ancestors of modern Native Americans. And this led people to, to, I don't say believe, but kind of advance this notion that perhaps the first Americans into the Western Hemisphere, the first Americans came from someplace other than Northeast Asia. Maybe they came from Europe, right? So this was this whole um, Salutrian hypothesis that, had, that was sort of rooted in similarities that um, certain lithicists saw in stone tools. But this idea that we see this dissimilarity between, you know, in terms of, in terms of skeletal morphology, a dissimilarity between the earliest Americans and ancestors of modern Native Americans. Let's this idea that maybe other things are going on here, right? Um, and certainly Naya did not look like, um, uh, look like the ancestors of modern Native Americans. But, um, you know, the research uh, took us in, you know, an interesting sort of direction. So uh, the first thing that we needed to do was obviously recover specimens from, physical specimens from her skeleton. Um, we tried with the rib and then focused instead on her teeth. And it was from her teeth that we were able to, uh, to date, to get a radiocarbon date um, for Naya. Um, this is not a, was not a bone collagen date, but rather a bioappetite date in tooth enamel. Um, not the gold standard, but the silver standard in terms of uh, bone dating. Um, and that was very fortunate for us. Um, also able to extract a viable DNA sample that went out to three different labs, all returning with the same result. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and so we had that direct dating of her skeleton, but uh, Patricia Beddoes on our project, who's a, um, a hydrogeochemist at Northwestern University, had this idea to say, listen, she's got little growths on her, on her bones, right? These are little speleothems, right? little um, calcite formations or florets growing on her bones. So if we can date those using uranium thorium dating, then we know that she had to come to rest on the bottom of that cave before those little bushes started to grow on her bones. And that gave us our boundary date. And those are very precise, very secure uranium thorium dates. So we did direct dating and indirect dating and producing an age range of um, 12,000 to 13,000 BP, which makes her the oldest complete set of human remains yet found in the Americas, although the oldest um, arguably would be Arlington Springs women here in Southern California at around 13,000, but that's only, um, a, that's a bone collagen date, but only from a very small uh, a fraction of her pelvis. <laughs> so, um, 
So this was a, to not only have an early individual, a Clovis age individual, but have a relatively complete skeleton was a remarkable thing. And so this is where she plots, right? And we won't go into to, um, the cave inundation aspect unless we have a little time at the end, but this was a bit of a puzzle here because we were, you know, based on what we found at the bottom of the pit, um, it seemed as if she went into to water, but yet the cave hadn't flooded until, until around 10,000 years ago. So what was going on? We can maybe visit that in a little bit. So, um, so we talk, now we have our date. But also, um, we had the opportunity to get viable DNA sample. And it came back D1, which is one of the founding five, A, B, C, D, and X. And these are Beringian-derived mitochondrial DNA haplogroups that are the result of genetic mutations that occurred here as people were parked in, uh, in Siberia sometime maybe between 26,000 and 18,000 BP. We start seeing these mutations appear. And it's those mitochondrial DNA mutations that are introduced into the Americas. So the Native American haplogroups are A, B, C, D, and X. And she's D1. Well, what does that mean? That means that she's the ancestor of Native Americans, that Native Americans are her descent. So she didn't come from Europe or someplace else, right? She came from, from, from Northeast Asia. She is the ancestor of descendant populations um, that perhaps did not look like her after several dozen generations, right? So that kind of steered us in a very different direction then. So perhaps these differences that we see with respect to cranial facial morphology are not the result of different source populations from different part areas outside of Northeast Asia, but are rather some genetic processes that are happening in the Americas, right? And so that opens up, or I don't say opens up, it expands uh, another area of research trying to better understand how to account for those physical changes over time without having to look far afield um, for, for other populations being introduced in the Americas. So it supports this, this model. Um, NIA supports this model. So uh, we published this in Science um, and um, generated a lot of interest and a number of conversations uh, with other um, uh, supportive and, and also skeptical uh, peers and colleagues, and, and it's been a really exciting, um, a really exciting project uh, that's developed as a result of, of um, you know, pushing these data out and, and enabling us to, um, to really get to work on, on the site itself. So Naya has since been recovered. This is Susan Bird and Beto Nava um, bringing Naya out, out of Oyo Negro, and we had to do that. Okay, so the problem was is there was unauthorized diving at the cave. Um, other cave divers were going in and damaging the site, some of them intentionally, uh, and the site was very much at risk. We didn't have the resources or the ability to close the cave. So uh, our really only alternative was to remove Naya and to bring her into the lab in conservation first and then into the lab, and she currently resides at the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. Um, so this was not something we wanted to do, but something that needed to happen but then, at the same time, allowed us to, uh, to move forward with, um, with, uh, with the research on, on those remains itself. So I mentioned the importance of doing these 3D models that also, interesting, allowed us to build these cases that allowed us to take the bones out of the cave more carefully. So we did 3D documentation of the bones in C2, and then 3D printed them, and then built um, these sort of custom receptacles for the bones from, based on those 3D prints, and we're able to use those as the re, uh, during the recovery. So this is Jim Chatters and um, Susan Bird, and, uh, and, and I had mentioned that um, now that we have Naya, uh, we had her, an opportunity to work with her in the lab, we've really been able to um, do some good science, uh, do a number of different kinds of studies and analyses that can uh, tell us a lot more about uh, who she is and what her life was like. And some of that will be published um, relatively soon. Um, we know a lot about, uh, about the nutritional stress that she endured. We know that she gave birth um, to a child at, at probably 15 years of age. Um, so these things are only possible by actually having those bones in the lab to, to do the analysis. So um, Oya Negro is a tricky site in terms of documentation. Um, this is difficult, more difficult than working in the shallow open water where you can see most things that you're mapping and documenting. And so you know, if we really want to reconstruct the natural processes that resulted 
in the deposition of these, um, not only these animals, but also these plants and other interesting um, and, uh, and potentially important deposits inside the cave. We need to be able to, to document them. We need to be able to do the level of documentation that allows us to take this si site topside and to work with it on campus and not necessarily work with it in the field. And so we had to move away from traditional forms of site documentation. We did some experimentation with spherical gigapixel imaging with some decent results, but really um, what was transformative of us was the photogrammetric work. And so this is, um, some of you are probably familiar with structure for motion photogrammetry or uh, these are machine vision algorithms that compute 3D geometry from two-dimensional photographs. It's actually a fairly common and, um, and uh, widely used technique for doing 3D documentation through photography. And what this enabled us to do was to photograph the, the two areas where we find um, Naya's remains, right? So he's a humerus here. And through a um, point-based visual analytics strategy that was developed by students in our lab, we're actually able to trace those points, right? So this is a point cloud. Right? These are um, hundreds of millions of points that, um, that we can interact with uh, in, in the lab and allow us to now, for example, remove the substrate and look at the nature of our articulation or disarticulation between the bones and other, and, and to understand how she came to rest on the cave floor. We can do a lot of these analyses virtually. We can make measurements. Um, we can look at, do contextual analysis. It's called taphonomy. And this is sort of de deposit level taphonomy, understanding the processes that acted on these um, organisms after they um, de were deceased and became part of, uh, of the record. And so th these are some techniques that uh, Vid Petrovich developed that allow us to work with these data that were all collected in situ, right? And we can do this virtually in the lab. So there's a number of different features from the, the software. It's called Viscore. Um, we can uh, project the original photographs that were used to compute the geometry onto the point cloud because there's maybe greater visual or color fidelity there so we can see details that maybe we don't see in the point data. Um, all of these are powerful tools for the scientists who are not going to dive there, right? I'm never going to go to the bottom of Boya Negro. It's not going to happen. I'm not <laughs> maybe if I was 20 years younger, I might, <laughs> I might uh, take up um, rebreather um, cave diving. It's not going to happen now. Um, so a lot of these data we work with back home. And again, um, this, when we do this documentation, it allows us to plan what we're going to sample and what we're going to recover. So this is the, um, uh, almost like working in a, in a sort of a, a virtual world to, to familiarize everyone with the p deposits and to plan for different site um, or, or um, bone recovery tasks, et cetera. So we're able to do that because we have these data. We're able to do the documentation. We're able to do it relatively rapidly. So the idea then is how do we take on the whole site? How do we produce a digital surrogate of the entire site of Oyo Negro where we can bring Oyo Negro into the lab and to, um, to work with these data? So we're putting this together one piece at a time. So here's the bottom of the pit, right? And it's obviously cut off from the, from the precipice above. Um, this is the path uh, that the divers used, um, take the photographs used to compute the geometry. Um, you can see we have a, uh, a lot of blue over here. Many of you photograph underwater, you know that you need to throw light to get better color. And so we know we need to go deeper over here to get more fidelity, um, higher resolution. There's all these spaces we need to fill in. Um, that takes time. And uh, we're just trying to get divers into the field and keep them in, in the field so we can continue to build out this map. But nothing like this has ever been done before for a site like Oya Negro. So we're really trying to throw everything we can at it in terms of um, uh, best possible technologies and, um, and really kind of advanced best practices and standards in the process. So um, I'll go ahead and see if I can move ahead. And so this is going to show you another aspect of what we're doing with respect to using um, the visual analytics approach and using this photogrammetric approach. Um, you can see that there's a lot of data that needs to be filled in. But what we're able to do is to get sort of a low resolution base map of the bottom of the pit and then focus on areas that are important. Different deposits, for example, different species that are of particular interest. Uh, it could be the bears, it could be the giant ground sloth. And the divers will image those, um, taking more images, um, different focal length, uh, you know, flat ports at a dome port, for example, um, get a, to produce a higher uh, resolution model um, through a denser point cloud of these areas. So here's the um, 
What you see here is the upper half of Naya's skeleton. You see her femur, there are ribs, radius, ulna, for example. That's all imaged in high resolution. And then we're going to move past the lower part of her skeleton. We can see her pelvis, the articulation between um, uh, you see two um, uh, femora here as well. You can see that she's got a, um, a, 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 um, her tibia and fibula as well. And so we're able to then take these higher resolution models and embed them in that larger model, right? And so now we're flying over to the giant ground sloths kind of hung up on the wall of the cave, right? Here I think we're passing in the pass through the, um, the birth canal <laughs> right here. I don't know, Vid put the fly through together. We're gonna fly right through your pelvis. Um, and then you can see some other areas of the cave where we have a lot of work to do, right, to really produce this map. Um, I'll show you this in a second, but we're actually able to do some of the document, close-up documentation. This is the cranium of the, of the giant ground sloth, for example, and then digitally insert them. So as we take things out of the caves, we can actually bring them back. Um, and we can do that digitally, but we can also do it physically because we're talking about actually um, being able to create replicas of all of the bones and reposition them back inside the cave. So we'll look at another one of these here. So, um, so this is an um, example of what we can do using uh, point-based visual analytics that allow us to select and trace these points. And it allows us to extract those specimens, right? So this one has not been recovered yet, right? So this is still, this one is still in C2, but through detailed photogrammetry, we're able to mark the points, trace it out, and then separate it from its substrate, and then bring it into an analytical environment where we can make measurements. Um, we can share that with other individuals. Here we're showing some of the process of cleaning that point cloud up. And now we're gonna select that Smilodon. This is Smilodon Thetalis. This is the um, saber-toothed cat, right? Okay, so now um, we'll be able to move into a mode where we can select certain points on the cranium to make measurements. We could also do an assessment of the quality of the photogrammetry. Okay, well maybe the, the photographer couldn't get the camera over here, so we have some occlusions, we have some areas where we don't have good data. You know, maybe we need to actually lift that cranium up and put it on a turntable underwater and take more photographs. Um, maybe this is a candidate for recovery, but maybe we wanna do an assessment of the structural integrity of that cranium before it's recovered. We can do that um, by looking at uh, doing very detailed analysis um, virtually in the lab. If we want to create a textured mesh, we can put that up on Sketchfab. People can play with it online. Um, and I should mention we're doing this with coral reefs as well. So this is um, uh, really trying to, to think very creatively about how we can bring what's underwater into the lab and, and into, the, into the public domain so people can interact with these models. So. And so, um, well, and I mentioned before, uh, sometimes you can't get all that information in C2, so we can either scan using structured light scanner, or laser scanning, or photogrammetry in the lab, and then um, remove or reinsert those higher resolution models um, into the master model. Um, so this is our giant ground sloth again. So this is what Beto was just photographing. Okay, let's take it out after we've selected it, right? And so we can do the, do the analysis um, uh, or you know, kind of look at it in its context and take it out of its context. So just other examples of what we can do. Yeah. So let's see. So we have the advantage at um, UC San Diego of having these large, immersive, big VR type environments that allow us to enter places like Oyo Negro in 3D, right? So this is a multi-tile display called the Wave. You put your glasses on and you're in the cave. Um, and the, the exciting thing for us is that, you know, we see in 3D, we interact with the world in 3D. So there's, a, uh, there's certain limitations by trying to understand a place like Oyo Negro by looking at your laptop screen. It's just not gonna happen, right? You could do it piecemeal. But if you really wanna dive in, it's gotta be big and it's gotta be 3D. And we're big fans of this at UC San Diego. So we bring these data sets, these multi-billion um, point clouds into environments uh, uh, like the wave here and get the, the, the vertebrate paleontologist, Blaine Schubert, who's an expert on cave bears, together with Jim Chatters, who's an expert on, um, on paleo-American uh, mor uh, skeletal morphology, among other things, Vid Petrovitz, the software developer, to have a conversation. 
right? So they're not going to dive Oyo Negro, but they could virtually dive it. And they could be there with the divers in the same lab having a conversation about what they saw. They can argue. They could yell at each other. <laughs> they could maybe new ideas will emerge. And what's happening, though, interestingly, is we're making discoveries in Oyo Negro in these environments. So if you think about it, many of you dive, you know, depending on, on how averse you are to task loading, um, you know, very often you're just focused on your life support, right? Your top priority is to make sure that, you know, you, you plan your dive and you dive your plan and you, and, and you stay safe and you manage your breathing gas, et cetera. Well, all that brain power that's going into to trim and buoyancy and gas management is in some ways taking your mind away from other things that you might otherwise notice, right? And so when you can get into a cave virtually in 3D, you can spend hours and hours and hours there, and you're like, we have the divers go, oh, wait, wait a minute, I didn't notice that before. Like, you know, and, and these are the divers who've been, who've been spending hours and hours at the bottom of this cave are seeing things in the, in the models and the imagery that they didn't see in the field. Um, and so on the flip side of that is that I would certainly love to put my own two eyes inside this cave because I might notice things in, in real life that I don't notice virtually. So um, it's a conversation and it also it has people sort of um, appreciate the, um, you know, the sort of domain of, of their peers and colleagues. You know, we're all sort of working together to try to put a puzzle like Oye Negro together. And we're doing the same thing Coral Reefs as well with our collaboration at Scripps Institution of Oceanography with Stuart Sandin in his lab is creating these digital surrogates of reef environments. And it's through the visual analytics that we're seeing patterns, we're seeing things that you can't see when you're on the reef, right? Because you can't, you can't see the forest for the trees. Um, and so there's so many different ways of visualizing these environments that can be transformative. So um, uh, I want to um, sort of end with a, uh, a trailer for a um, special a PBS Nova National Geographic special that aired uh, a couple months ago. Um, it's somewhat uh, theatrical, but it, it'll um, in, you know introduce will be, will be Susan and Beto, and you can kind of see the divers express in their own words how exciting it was to find a place like Oya Negro. And I'll play that. It'll just be like maybe a minute, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, oh wait a minute, did it not play? Oh here we go. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if it comes on. Hopefully it'll come. Nope. We can see at the end of this tunnel, we can see this, this darkness. And the moment we swam into Italy and everything was black. So breaking all the rules of cave diving, Alex and I went out for a loop. We started finding uh, animals, like big, big bones we knew that could be from the Ice Age. Just as we thought it couldn't get any better, when I mean, you have all these animals, you have all this beauty, all of a sudden we go a little bit up. And we look and then there's this human skull. It's like, hard to describe it, but it felt like a jolt of electricity through the water. Naya is perhaps the oldest, most complete set of human remains yet found in the Americas. We're going to learn more from her skeleton than any other set of human remains anywhere in the Americas. We're going to bring her out of that cave, and so she will see the light for the first time. Ask you if, if uh, this cave and this pit had been in the United States instead of Mexico, how would your research approach have differed? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a probing question. Um, we probably would not have. Uh, hopefully, there would be the protections in place that would allow us to leave Naya in situ, and we don't take it lightly that we're um, interacting with uh, the 
the remains of a, of a young individual who walked this earth 12, 13,000 years ago. And, and, um, you know, and that's, that's a very special thing to be able to work with uh, um, uh, the remains of an individual like Naya. Um, but they, it's much more complicated in the United States. And certain legislation exists through NAGPRA that, um, that allows uh, American Indian groups to, um, through, a, through a process, um, to uh, essentially potentially repatriate um, sets of human remains. And so a project like this may very well not have happened in the United States. Um, now, Mexico has uh, very uh, well-reasoned and well-structured regulations that pertain to all things archaeological and paleontological. And so this exists in a very robust regulatory framework in Mexico. So all the work is done in compliance with those regulations through the National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico. And this is, I should mention, a Mexican project through what's called the Subdirección de Arqueología Subacuática. So it's just that that regulatory framework is, is a little bit different than in the United States. Um, and uh, it's such that we're able to, to do the kinds of analyses on the bones themselves that otherwise might be more difficult in the United States. And it, and it doesn't mean that, uh, that it's uh, lax, uh, uh, that it's not uh, rigorous. It's very rigorous. It's because yeah. it's the same thing that we see with aquaculture, for example. You can go across the border into Baja, and you can get a permit for aquaculture probably in six to 12 months. We've never issued a permit in the United States for an offshore fin fish farm. And uh, we've, spent, we've been after one in, off San Diego now for about five or six years, several million dollars. And you can't, it isn't that you, you can't get to yes or no, it's always maybe. maybe. And, and so the people in Southern California, we often say, well, you go to Mexico, they don't have any standards. It is, it's not true. They have a process that gets to yes or no. Yeah, and that's, that's been our experience. And it's been a pleasure working with our Mexican colleagues. And I should, uh, I should mention that there's been very effective cooperation between Native American groups um, in the United States and, and the scientific community. The Anzic child is a very good example of that. So we have wonderful DNA from Anzic um, that's a result of that collaboration between uh, Native peoples and, and, uh, and researchers. Who has a question, Razor? And I'll bring you the microphone so people who are watch watching remotely won't be able to hear. Your presentation is just awesome. I mean, probably for a very long time, I'm going to reflect back on a lot of these images. How was the name Naya given, which is beautiful, and where her bones were scattered in so many places? Is there a story as to why, and do you have her whole body all together? We now? do. That's, and that's a good question. The, um, uh, Naya uh, alludes to the water nymphs of Greek mythology. Um, people would say, oh, well, she's not Greek. Well, of course. Um, give her a Maya name. Well, she's not Maya either. So we don't really know. This was a name that was given to her by the divers, and, and so Naya she became. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's a very good question about the, the nature of, of her, of the distribution of the bones, her bones at the bottom of the pit. So, um, so think about what happens, say, with an individual goes into deep water, right? So, um, uh, someone drowns, right? And they may become negatively buoyant for a time, but as gases expand, as they decompose, they become positively buoyant and they float. And then as those gases escape, they become negatively buoyant, or at least neutrally buoyant to negatively buoyant again. Ultimately, as the individual decomposes, as a person's corpse decomposes, things start to separate. The arms might fall away from the torso, the legs will fall away, the cranium. And the more distance that that individual has to travel from wherever they are in the water column to the bottom um, is really going to, uh, there's a relationship between that distance and the distribution at the, at, on the seafloor. So um, in our case, she was relatively constrained in two separate, um, relatively well-articulated segments, and uh, which means that she went into shallow water. Um, and we also have trauma on her skeleton that's associated with a very high fall into a very shallow pool. Um, so she has a, um, perimortem fractures on her, on her pelvis, for example. Um, she may have died on impact, but she certainly went into water. And what it looks like happened um, briefly is that she separated around the midsection as she started to decompose and the lower half of her skeleton remained relatively fleshed and, and intact and well articulated and then settled out onto that complex substrate known as Rillencairn. It's very craggy. 
and then um, the upper part of her skeleton um, uh, was, an, uh, was only about a couple meters away. And then crania roll, so the, the cranium had rolled to the position where we found it, et cetera. So, um, but what it looks like happened is that she went into, into a shallow pool of water. Um, and we think that that was probably the result of episodic flooding in the cave, a perched water table, because the sea level should not have pushed the water table up into that chamber to flood it yet. That wasn't gonna happen for a couple thousand more years. But there was definitely water. So, so let me see if I understand then the sequence of flooding. 18,000 years ago, sea level was 400 feet lower. Mm -hmm. This cave was dry, the pit was- Pit was dry. Pit was dry. Yeah and dark and animals and people mm -hmm. came in, some of them fell over the, and into this, this mm -hmm. pit. Sea level began to rise in about 10,000 years ago. It got high enough, sea level flooded the cave mm -hmm. and began, filled the, began to fill the pit, causing the lighter fresh water to rise. That's correct. Sea level continued to rise to the present position. So my question is, is that water be, being renewed now, or is that water eight to 10,000 years old? It's old. The it's water old. at the bottom of the pit is old. Right. And because and, um, and it, it's not exchanging right. with, it's marine water, but it's not it's exchanging. It's not exchanging. With, yeah, and so we, we, in other areas, we see that exchange. Right. But in Oye Negro, it's such a deep pit um, that that water is very, very old. And is that water now anoxic, devoid it of is. oxygen? It is, so it's largely anoxic at the bottom of the pit which would have resulted in favorable uh, conditions for preservation for many of the organic right. materials. So we right. find endocarp seeds, other right. kinds of wood, for example, that's relatively well, well preserved at the bottom. But it's the structural preservation as a result of fossilization of the bones that was not a necessarily a result of anoxic conditions, but rather the, um, the sort of dissolved um, calcium carbonate in the water that, uh, that um, hardened the bones and made them a little bit more resistant. So. And I, I have been to the Qualcomm Institute and seen the coral reef, and I think all of these amazing things that you're able to do with technology, they still depend upon having these dense sets of photographs and, and real yeah. data. Yeah. Say a word about that. Yeah, well, and it's very time consuming. Here, I'll put a more interesting slide up for, there we go. <laughs> um, and that's, that's me in a place where I'm happiest, so. Um, just, just relaxing right close to the drip edge. That's like my favorite place to be. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's labor intensive and it's also data intensive. Um, the point clouds themselves are not, are not that bulky, um, but dealing with all that imagery to get to those point data is, is, is definitely a challenge. And so what we're really pushing, um, we're gonna continue what we're doing in Oye Negro, provided we're able to continue to support the project. Um, but when we think about the coral reefs, I mean, we would like to see this happen at select reef sites around the world. And what's probably gonna wind up happening is we're gonna have a lot of people taking a lot of photographs and sending us a lot of hard drives, because you can't, you, this is not gonna come up through the commodity internet, right? This is people actually physically sending you hard drives with thousands and thousands of photographs on them. And we're gonna you know, fire up the supercomputers and process these images to, to get the good data so we can start building these digital surrogates and doing the analysis. And it's a big push that we have at UC San Diego right now. It's all, asp I mean, it's happening, but the scale is aspirational, right? We, we know where we wanna go. We don't have the means to get there quite yet, but um, it's definitely a, a, a wild and woolly frontier for, for 3D documentation because there's so much involved in, in, in get, turning these photographs into, into 3D models. But once we have those data, they become as uh, Falco Kruster, who's the director of our lab, refers to these as sort of passive sensor networks. Because each one of those points is an XYZ coordinate. And it could change over time. So you image a coral reef one year, you come back, and those points are not in the same place. What happened? Well, we can see certain corals growing, certain corals um, dying. We can see that you, know, you take, again, this sort of diachronic view, and you can actually sort of quantify the changes in species health, species growth, volumetrics, all of that's possible with real quantitative data, and it's, it's light years beyond you know, what was possible just doing standard quadrats. Um, and so we're really, really excited about that because it's, they're seeing things now when you turn on and off different species, certain patterns emerge. So what's going on here with respect to how these coral eco ecology or these coral communities grow? And, it's, and is it a function of substrate? Is it a function of 
of um, you know, how the polyps are moving around because of current, we don't know. Um, so it's, it's a new frontier of discovery for coral reef ecology that's really made possible by using these same techniques. And given what's happening to coral reefs globally, it's also a tool to look at why are some able to cope with yep. increases in temperature yep. and ocean acidification and, and others are not. Hi. You said that Naya had suffered from nutritional stress. Do you have any more details about that that you have learned from that condition? Yeah, so it hasn't been published yet. I suppose I can, I mean, camera's on, I guess I can mention. No, no, nobody's um, listening. <laughs> So um, the, she has pronounced Harris lines in her, in her, on her, in her bones that show um, times of uh, um, increased nutrition and nutritional um, deprivation or nutritional stress. And so um, it seems like she received her protein in these sort of large um, packets where they would be, would, would be able to consume meat in quantity for a certain period of time and then basically live on the very edge of starvation for a good part of the year and then get that. Now that seemed very odd to us because she didn't live that far from the coast and she doesn't seem to be, have the same kind of maritime adaptations with respect to coastal resources that we would have expected for someone who um, lived relatively close to the Caribbean coast at the time. Of course, the coast being a little bit further out on the east, much further out on the north because it's more shallow. Um, so we're seeing that she had a pretty hard life uh, and that life would have been very difficult for, um, for her peers as well, having to hunt big game and make use of other resources on the landscape during, during this time period the, uh, at the end of the last ice age. And remember the water, you know, many, they had to go in search of water inside these caves. The animals did as well. So these, you know, when you go across the Yucatan Peninsula today, you see these cenotes. Um, many of them were just dry pits, um, you know, 12, 13,000 years ago. It, it's remarkable how much information is contained in, in these artifacts. Yeah. And uh, years ago, we, we wrote a book, uh, several of us, about what Chesapeake Bay was like when John Smith sailed in there in 1607. And, if, and, and, and looking at some of the, uh, the bones of Native Americans, there were, and we've, we were able to do that. The average lifespan of, of an, a Native American then was estimated to be less than 40, 38 or 39 years. And they had terrible arthritis. I don't, anyway, who has not? Wait, we'll get one there and then I'll be back to you. You had mentioned um, the use of rebreathers and everything like that. And I can only imagine that, you know, diving into a cavern such as this or even these cave systems would have to come up with a lot of new innovation for especially just your own equipment, thinking about like particulates in the water and the limestone around you just deteriorating as soon as those air bubbles hit it. Um, what was, just could you describe that journey as like when you, as soon as you get in there, did you like everybody back out, we need to bring in, or did you well, already have the rebreathers with to you? To be or? perfectly honest, they had to do the bulk of the initial documentation of the site in open circuit scuba because no one could afford rebreathers. I mean, it was just, it was unimaginable to ever think that you would have the money to be able to buy a rebreather. So it was just the complete lack of funding. Um, <laughs> we've met that we, open circuit had to stick around for a little while until I think everyone could have put the brakes on it. So we got to redouble our efforts to raise funding for the project so we can get everyone on, on closed circuit rebreathers. And, and it really does make a difference. You know, as you mentioned, I mean, as many of you know, when you exhale, um, you know, those bubbles in your open circuit school, those bubbles go up and they usually just go up to the surface when you're in open water. Well, in this case, they're going up and hitting the ceiling and the sediment is detaching from the ceiling and, and raining down on the site like snow. And so this negatively impacts the site um, in, a, in, a, in a number of ways, right? Now you have this accumulation of sediment that you created through exhaling that wasn't there before. Um, also, it makes it very difficult to do the photogrammetry because now you have these sort of semi-turbid conditions that kind of confound the software's ability to be able to match, match uh, features in the image. Um, so that, that was a big push to go to, and we're still struggling. I mean, I just got an email this morning. It's like, hey, you know, you need $400 to get the rebreather fix. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna answer that email <laughs> right now. Um, so it's a, it is a, it's, it's a, but we realize that that's incredibly important because we want to um, minimize impact to the site or other sites like Oyo Negro. And the thing is, is even though they're now on closed circuit uh, rebreathers, every time they enter the bottom of the pit, you're bringing in with you whatever's on your, on your dry suit and whatever's on your gear. And there's a very delicate um, 
chemical, chemical ecology at the bottom of the pit that we're no doubt changing. And so we want to minimize the m amount of time in the cave, and that's why it's important to do a lot of that planning topside so we can really um, you know, target those particular tasks that are most essential um, and do it in the most efficient way. And um, what hasn't helped, of course, is the fact that it's very difficult to close the site. People continue um, to break in and um, have unfortunately caused some amount of damage to the site. Um, you know, the, even though the site has, you know, has a soft barrier in the passageways leading to the pit, there's signage everywhere from the Mexican government saying, do not dive here. Um, I can't figure out why anyone, what's going through someone's mind when they go into a site like that. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't, I mean, we think as divers, right? I mean, we just, we would, you know, uh, we would never even think about touching coral with our, you know, with the tip of our fin, but yet these are, these are completely, these are incredibly rare specimens and deposits, and yet people think nothing of picking them up and cracking them open and looking inside. And so, um, so it's been, I, I, that's been a real struggle for us. So, some of you know that we created a science on a sphere experience about the dispersal of humans out of Africa. And we would like to do one with Dominique on the early settlement of mm -hmm. the Americas. And so I hope we're going to do that. Yeah, Did good. you have another question, Francis? No. No. Oh, you have one. OK, wait. Did your DNA analysis suggest that she was Negroid? Uh, no. Um, she, um, do you, do you, have, do you? Uh, I mean, this is her site came from Africa, right? Well, her, her, I don't, her D1, subhaplogroup D1 is Beringian in origin. Right. But we haven't done complete autosomal work, so we don't have her full genetic picture. We just have her, her mitochondrial DNA. Um, and that work is ongoing. Um, she, uh, you know, it's interesting when you think about the cranial facial morphology that, um, that statistically it would group in such a way as to resemble populations outside of Northeast Asia, Africa, for example, Australia. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's a lineal connection to those individuals. Um, but as best as we can tell, her ancestry points to, to Northeast Asia. Dominique, it's a great story. Thank you very much for coming to share yeah, it with us. Yeah, we appreciate it.